Welcome back to the Mycidian Legend, the only FFTCG podcast with players that are not good in winnaboxes. Uh, if it's your first time <laughs> listening, then uh, each week we cover our locals' experience, including our deck lists and how we can improve our play in the future. Uh, and if we have extra time, or maybe we didn't make it out to locals, then we'll highlight different cards or decks that we are working with and more. So uh, as stated at the top here, we weren't just working with the locals this week, we're actually um, working uh, with a, a win a box tournament. So uh, I'm joined by David as always. Say hey, David. Well, um, if you need to tune out the podcast, tune out now because you got the spoiler at the beginning. We did not do so hot. Yeah, um, but you know what? That's great because that really plays into the improvement part of the podcast. So we can still um, entertain you in that way. But before we get to the entertainment, we have to talk about Cards of Ivalice because they've given us a promo code to use for you, and it's Porum Palum 10, uh, and you can use that on your purchase. And it shows that you support the Mysidia post, but it also gets you a nice little discount on your order. So that promo code is Porum Palum 10. Porum Palum 10. Use it. Capital P's for both Porum and Palum. Yeah, and you know That's what I've got? Thing, right? I think so. I've also uh, made a little like advert at the for the beginning of my videos with like uh, Porum Palum 10 popping up, and I'm talking about it, and there's yeah, it's going to be real nice. So all my new videos are going to have that as well. You can check it out there. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into what we were playing at the Winnebox. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, David's list first. Uh, we'll give you a quick pause and if you see if you can say it out loud what you think he's playing. Yep, you guessed it right. He's playing FF9 Firewater. Uh, David, why don't you talk about it? Uh, I'd rather delay and not talk about this at all. This has been a podcast that I've actually been dreading talking about. Um, so basically what happened was uh, we were testing leading up to the event, and I was feeling super... I was feeling great about my list, honestly. And then the day before, or two days before, I just really kind of got in my head and started second-guessing myself. So I ended up just kind of building this uh, list that I saw that won the Ultros Cup. Built that, saw how that played with against uh, against some friends literally the night before, including yourself, obviously. And I was really I don't want to you know sh- s talk some decks, but I I didn't enjoy it personally. I wasn't finding uh, success. Like the play style just wasn't resonating with me. Um, so I was feeling really down about it kind of switched back a little more things to um, closer to my original list and kind of it, it got a little bit better but then I I didn't completely switch back so I went in having cut um, things like uh, 4CP Ash and Tidus and some of my cool little techie um, combos and I severely paid for it. I did really poorly. I cut them for the Zonde to bring back things like um, 3CP Palum, uh, Archangel, Furion, Warrior of Light, uh, 1CP VV, Naji, which I thought would give it the firepower to really uh, clear boards that would be popping up due to Grand Pierre decks and water decks and wind water, etc. But unfortunately, it uh, didn't work out for me. Yeah, I don't think I realized that you cut the Ash and stuff, and that's crazy because Ash is obviously so so awesome it's such a good card and it works really well with your ping to remove abilities because you love you love getting things out of there you like breaking forwards and not letting them do what they're supposed to do so that's uh that's a shame and the one thing i want to mention for for the audience is that because david plays a lot of final fantasy 9 uh firewater we all all of his testing partners we all know the deck so well at this point and we we know exactly like what it his deck has, which makes it kind of a hard testing experience because you have to beat people that are um, more able to predict what you're going to do. So for example, he's doing the Zonde test, and I'm like, he's playing Zonde. I just drew a Shantoto, and I'm like, 
Okay, it's, he hasn't played it yet, so it's coming at some point. I'm just going to hang on to this Shantoto. So he does a Zonde board wipe, and it completely, like, it was actually really impressive. Completely cleared my board, and I was ahead and everything. And he has a huge board, so then I just play the Shantoto, and I'm back in charge again. And um, So it's like, well, okay, the Zonde worked, but um, how to... But it put me right back on the back foot. And but you know what, a- though, like... Let's say I'm playing some random, you know, like uh, like John FFTCG. I'm playing against him, and he's he plays. I'm like super far ahead on board. I might not keep that Shantoto in hand. I might think like I'm pretty set on board here. I'm going to pitch the Shantoto for CP, and then the Zonde catches me by surprise. But I literally thought to myself, he's playing Zonde, um, and I'm just gonna uh, keep this. So kind of interesting. So what you're telling me is I need to go to a different locals. Yeah, or just, you know, um, play different decks so we're not always <laughs> that's aware. That's not an option. Yeah, because that's the other one. Like, you know, you if I, let's say I played my Mono Earth forever, you would, always, you would always know what my Mono Earth entailed. And you probably do actually know my Mono Earth pretty well, but I'm... And my Ice Earth at this point as well, but, you know, I, I'll just, like, build a totally different deck and then, you know, it switched up, so... Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's kind of where I had planned on taking like a two-week hiatus from the game just to kind of recover my bruised ego about all this. But then, yeah, literally the night of, I'm rebuilding something, and you just saw the new things that I'm testing with, and there's an all-time low of FF9 cards, so I think I am I think I need a break from that deck entirely. Or not entirely, because I still have some Final Fantasy IX cards, um, cards but i think that's know, basing it around vv and stuff i'm just kind of moving away from that from now yeah and you know what though i think that's really uh really fine like you can your deck is still going to be an ff9 deck with lots of ff9 synergy but you're not going to be playing like a full ff9 backup line and and a ton of different forwards like you i think it's the deck that you just played we just played a match on untapped and it was uh it was a really really fun match so, yeah, I still lost, but you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I kind of had like the, like I don't know if you noticed that game. So I was playing Earthwind uh, standard units, and I started my first turn, played Chaos Pass, play Sh- or play Star Sybil the next turn, and then drew my second Star Sybil, and I essentially um, drew the you nuts that right quick. So yeah. I'm playing off five backups all game, and I don't know if you noticed, I never played a single Earth backup. Right, and then all of a sudden I'm playing my Warrior Lights and and all these other cards, Earth cards. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't have happened if I didn't have that chaos. Uh, so, like, yeah, right. The fact you that started I started the game just playing uh, I had, Wind Earth, and then it yeah. kind of gradually became a standard unit deck. But I also like you took me right to the brink, and I had my best possible opening. And I thought you were going to brick again. I, the there was a couple of turns where you had some really um, like a pass, and what another turn you played. Um, a Black Waltz 2 for no value, and I'm like, oh, God, it's it's one of these matches. Um, so I got, like, a lot of time to set up and do everything, and then you stormed right back and brought it to 7-6 in the end. So it was uh, it was a good match. I'm excited about that list. No, for sure. And I'm excited for it, too. It's just, uh, it's just tempering at this point. And I feel like we've already kind of divulged into the next segment of how do we can improve, but... That's fine. Oh, we'll, well, we'll we'll go more detail. We'll we, have, we haven't actually said the the main combo yet. Okay. So, is yeah. there anything else you want to talk about for your for your deck for the winner box? Um, I'm just really I'm kind of just disappointed in myself that I didn't just roll with the stuff I've been testing before, and that's that's just, that's just disappointing. Like I worked on it for so long, and then second guess it the day before, and change up kind of the main, or not the main combos, but some of the better cards and. I wish I, think, I didn't do that, but congratulations to uh, to Yuda and Julian for doing so well. Yeah, well, I, th- I think um, that uh, a lot of people can relate to you with the uh, tampering with their decks, including me. I've tampered with my Ice Earth quite a bit, um, but I'm starting to identify which cards are locked in and which cards I'm still playing around with. Um, and again, we'll get up to all of that later on. But first of all, we'll go back to what uh, what I'm doing with my Ice Earth that I've been playing and I've been talking about a lot on the podcast. And I've ended up 
switching it yet again. Uh, last time we talked, I was mentioning how I was putting in star symbols. We were going with the cam because I needed the chaos. Um, and I just, I played that a bunch and the star symbols and the Emperor Gestals both playing five CP forwards from your hand or like, I guess star symbol six CP, uh, but they're all five CP in my list. Uh, it's too much similar things and the star symbol at 5 cp wasn't getting me enough value and i couldn't break both backups for value so i was just kind of losing in that regard uh so i had to take the star symbol out and i just said you know what f it we're taking cam out again and we're gonna try to roll with two reagans a hein two gestals and a chaos and if i find the chaos great and if i don't that's okay and that was going really, re really well in testing. Like that, I hadn't, I didn't have any bricks. I didn't have any issues. It's six dark cards, which is quite a bit. But overall, like it was going really well. I put some um, five CP uh, Earth Cecils in for more defense. I uh, ended up putting a Sarah for discard and a last wall in for some ping. Both of those are huge. Uh, have helped out quite a bit. So the the deck's really taken shape. Um, but. The main, the main issue that I ended up having was bricking with dark cards. So we'll get into that next. We're going to talk about uh, the matches and how they went. Uh, so let's get into it. Okay, so David, what do you think? Do you want to go over your first round or should I go over mine? Uh, uh, let's go over mine, I guess. Okay. All right, so my first match was against uh, Mono Fire, which actually gave me a lot, a lot of inspiration for what's come to come in this podcast. What we're going to talk about, um, Mono Fire, he got down. It was really back and forth. We both started with uh, Haster. Uh, I, he started with the Haste Tifa. I started with uh, Turn One Haste Zidane, which honestly that kind of bodes more for my favor because I'm drawing off of it. Um, but unfortunately, when you have such small forwards that my deck does, like VV, Zidane, um, et cetera, et cetera, it's really easy for a fire deck to just kind of ping those off because he doesn't even need to combo off it. It's just play a black wall, it's play an ace, play whatever, and you're done. Uh, the thing's in the break zone. Um, and then he, it was really back and forth for pretty much the entire game. Then he got his uh, Opus 10 Zac down. And that's pretty much where everything started going south for me because he was just pinging stuff off. He had uh, the war mech out, which made Zach do just double his damage done. And that was pretty much all she wrote. I'm pretty sure the game ended like 7-6 or 7-5. Really close game, but came out short on that one. Yeah, that's a, a tough matchup for you. And, and I mean, it was really close in the end. And... Um... That's just that's really tough with all the ping that I know that um, Greg plays in this mono fire that it like it's hard for you to establish any sort of a board and it actually goes doesn't work so well with uh, your um, your Gilgamesh either in that that's not like protected against anything in fire. And the thing is that um, he doesn't play a lot of summons with his deck, his mono fire deck. It's all abilities. So I got down the two CP Garnet, thinking, "Oh, I'm just going to protect myself. This is the fire killer." Nope, because it's just, all of his stuff is abilities. So kudos to him to being able to play around that as well. Really w makes me wish I had a Minwu down, but you know, yeah, as it that, is, that's tough. Um, so uh, I, I also wanted to mention, um, I forgot to mention at the top of the segment here that the win a box was eight players. Uh, we played three rounds of Swiss and then we just had everybody make the top cut. So um, David and I still played top cut matches uh, and then the top cut was best of three. Um, so my first round was against uh, Mono Ice and it was really tough. I, I bricked, uh, I drew five dark cards i basically i drew my all my dark cards except for the final reagan um and i actually started like after taking some early damage i started to stabilize um because my opponent overextended a little bit so i was able to stabilize with sid alstein uh and play a cecil and, and kill another thing so i'd taken so much damage and all of a sudden i'm back on the board with sid alstein and cecil so i attack with them and then they get wiped by a Zalira before damage or before the second damage so then I'm back on the back foot again. Um, and I was trying to set up a Shantoto comeback 
uh, at the end of that match, and it was really tight. I just needed an extra turn to set it up, but my opponent just kind of um, finished me off. And it was frustrating because I actually had played that player the night before in testing, same decks, and both games we played, I had won fairly handily. Like, I had a really good... Like, the earth in my deck over his mono ice just gave me an edge, and I never got to do that in this game. So I ended up going down um, in that match. Yeah, that's a, that's a really tough one, because once if you draw a lot of dark cards early against his... I know the player super well as well. Against that mono ice, he's just going to... You're going to brick hard at the beginning... And then he's going to make you just discard more and more as the game goes on. And then it's just kind of tough, tougher to kind of come back from that. Would, would that. would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think so. Like, at one point he made me discard two dark cards with Sephiroth. And I was just like, I looked at him and I said, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just want these out of my hand. <laughs> it was like I had six cards in my discard pile and five of them were dark. Like, Or no, I guess four were because I played the chaos, but still... <laughs> just ridiculous um too many yeah couldn't discard anything awesome so let's talk about second round we're both 0-1 at this point and uh um, we're looking to bounce back in a big way uh okay so for my second round i played uh wind water but not the wind water that everyone assumes with the yrp and the world championships list that everyone brought but it was um, it was based around Sid Brave Exvius, which I thought was super cool. Ended up losing due to deck out, which is just one of the most frustrating ways to lose ever. It just kind of sucked because he did a lot to remove from my break zone, which my deck has a lot of interaction with it. So anything, the pull roams, the uh, VVs, etc., Zidans, instead of going to the break zone where I can recur them, they just got removed from the game due to 5 CP Yuna. Every time I brought tried to bring something back from the break zone that I might have had, if said Brave Exodus was out, or he fan frit or something like that, and they go right back into the remove from they get removed from the game. So that just really cut down my main strategies and all my firepower. So it was a close game. I can't remember the exact damage off the top of my head, and I wish I wrote it down. I was just really in my head at this point. I didn't write it down, and uh, yeah, lost due to deck out. To be honest, both your matches were so close. Like, it's it's one of those variance things too, where like obviously, good players are gonna win more. But it's a card game, and at the end of the day, like anyone can just like anyone can just lose lose any given a day, Sunday, baby. Any right? given Sunday, like any team can beat any team. You could have you could have gone two zero at this point, but you didn't. Uh, no. And neither did I. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you could have done it. You could have gone two and zero, but you didn't. So I played against Waff, which is uh, yeah, let's un- tell us about that match. Undoubtedly, the I've I even pract- I've practiced against more against Waff than any other deck this Opus, and it was going really well. It was the perfect start. I got to set up to my three backups without. Uh, too much early pressure the player was able to get out you know your full rain and everything um and i was able to remove it and right when there was two rains in the break zone they tried to recur one i missed dragon so now there's only one rain and one lawn left in the deck but obviously the the rain came into the into play the next turn the third one so we went to six six damage i had a full board and my opponent refilled their board, and I just needed to push through, but I just couldn't get there. The LeBro on the other side of the field was pumping up the rain to 9k, which was ended up being the relevant thing. Unfortunately, I didn't draw, I didn't get any Shantotos or any um, Hines, which are both really good in that matchup. But overall, like it, it was, it was a at the time it was really testing of my mental state because I. Well, one, because how much I practiced, but two, because I literally did everything you're supposed to do against WAF. I did, uh, I, I was able to to get back into the game after the aggression, and I and I brought it all all the way to the end, and it just it still still didn't work out. So that was that was pretty frustrating. But yeah, at that point we're both zero and two. Yeah, your uh, heroes ain't doing so hot. My hero. 
<laughs> the, for the audience, we're their heroes. And we're oh, not right, so of hard. course, yes, yeah, no, we're we're obviously the heroes of the story. We're yeah. the protagonists of these stories, and uh, right now we're more Cinderella pre-ball than we are post-ball. Now, one thing I, w- I do want to mention is that we had talked about kind of some mental practice and in, in the previous podcast we had talked about mindset and uh like preparing yourself to do your best and after the mono ice loss where i bricked like obviously i didn't feel like i i was in that game as much as i could have been um and i feel like that was a really prime opportunity for me to tilt but i didn't i i went to the washroom i took a deep breath and i came back and i sat and i watched matches and i went into the waff match in a really good mindset i felt really positive and throughout that game i felt great and i didn't win and i was for sure salty at the end but i once again reset myself and i was i was feeling pretty happy uh despite being 0 and 2 um, I told myself before the tournament that this was going to be like, let's say it just doesn't go well. Well, then that means it's great practice for a reunion and I can tune up my deck and figure out what I'm going to do. Uh, so I kind of just took that mindset. So then I'm going into the third round and I'm feeling great. Uh, and my opponent is David. Oh yeah. Super. So this game went really well for me. That, yeah. the, the fact that at the end of the game, you're like, man, I'm sorry. I was okay. like, yeah, that's all you need to say. So here's one. I'll read my notes. I have notes right here for this game. Do you want to hear them? Oh, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. Lay it on me, coach. I set up very nicely. My opponent played a Zidane, but a Zalira was able to take care of it. He replays a Zidane and ha- oh, sorry, he's Zidane and hasted it. Uh, and then once again, he Zidane's and hastes, but I have a Glassia this time to 7k and discard. Uh, so at that point, uh, my opponent, because I always write my opponent in these notes, went into just a bunch of dead hands and bricked, and I continued to play cards and discard and close out the game, and it just kind of ended. Yeah, after those two, uh, after you dealt with both Zidons, it was just, and then you start making me discard more and more. But you also it was have... tough to come back from. I think, like straight up, you drew two cards, passed three times, like three turns you straight up didn't have a play or something like it was crazy yeah, yeah it was pretty brutal Man, so, i couldn't believe how badly it was drawing but yeah it, it really it really sucks after your first two games were so tight they were and close then, they could have gone either way and then this is how i go oh and three heading out of swiss so it was yeah and, and you, if you like think about my purpose of testing my deck like what a vote of confidence i went oh two and some some matches and then my win was against a brick so it's like what have i learned about my deck i don't really know uh so at this point we're going into top eight and david's going to be paired against the number one ranked after swiss which was yuda and his rampier deck uh, and i'm ranked against because my strength of opponent was pretty poor my only win came against david and he was 03 so i was against the second uh, ranked after Swiss, which was Julian from last week that we was on the podcast and his Rydia deck. So we go into our top eight, our um, best of three matches. And David, why don't you talk about yours? So um, after my max w- match with Alex, I kind of took a walk just to do that mental recovery. I was in mental recovery mode. Tried to come back and go, okay, it's reset. It's zero zero at this point. Nothing mat- before this had mattered. Um, and actually came out pretty strong. Um, I got, I knew Rampier, the last thing I want is for him to be able to just get his big board of canes and Shantotos and et cetera, et cetera. So I came out hard. Um, I jumped out to a quick, like, five five to two lead. And un- unfortunately, when Rampier gets set up and going, it gets set up and going um, against a great player as well, obviously. So he was able to break the Rampiers. Um, get out canes, just continuously recur stuff, have these huge turns that are just kind of unfair where he's getting Gabranth down and then in, and Shantoto and then Kane and literally like all three of those in one in one turn. So it, it just um, it accumulated too much value and too much of a board presence too quickly while also being able to remove mine that he was able to make a comeback and end up winning 7-5. It was a it was a really good game, just and I came out hot out of the gate. Just really, it was a tough game. It was just disheartening that that's how I had to go out. But 
that's how I went out. And that's pretty much how it went down for uh, both the games. So I ended up losing Owen, uh, going on one the first match. Second match was kind of, um, it was it was pretty similar, honestly. So he came out with a little bit more heat to match mine instead of just sitting back and waiting for himself to get set up. And then with those bi- those big boards, I kind of struggled to get rid of big boards like that. Zonde, I think I got a Zonde one Zonde combo off, but. It wasn't enough, and he was able to go two and zero, and on to the next round. Yeah, and um, Yuda would go on to beat Daniel playing Mono Ice to go into the finals, and then on the other side of the bracket, I'm playing Julian. Uh, so the first match I set up very well, and I was able to get my Flan going on. So something I've identified with this deck is that I need to get Flans out, and I cannot. The first flan I play needs to. I need to search the other flans with it. I can't use it for discard unless it's like a pivotal moment where I need to sit Alstein something and take a lot of advantage. But otherwise, I have to keep that flan out um, and search with it. So I'm setting up, and as is my opponent, and uh, I get to a point where I'm able to um, double discard with flan. Or sorry, discard with one flan and then Sephiroth Shadow Flare. So five discard in one turn. Um, that really shut down my, uh, Julian's offense. And I started attacking him, put lots of damage on him. Then he started casting his huge summons, uh, removing things from the game. So I couldn't finish the game off. Uh, but I won by mill in the end because I was just ahead on damage. That really helped out quite a bit and the discard did its job. He did whiff on one radio, which is super frustrating uh, for him, obviously. Uh, So we had to go to game two. In game two, it was a close match, uh, but he was pushing through with a lot of big summon removal on my forwards, so I just couldn't play anything. Every time I played a a Sephiroth and other forwards, he would then cast things uh, like um, Bahamut and the oh i'm totally forgetting ride in the nine cp uh and then phoenix as well the seven cp and i just couldn't ever swing with anything so we went all the way through the game again and he was able to play more forwards and then swing for game game three was really quick it was tough he got out early swung first damage shantoto hits me again second damage later on hits me again third damage shantoto uh, and I never saw the third Shantoto. I played a Hind early to try to stabilize, and he played a Veritas to kill it, which is his only out to the Hind. And at that point, it was that's it. I'm pretty, pretty toast. So he uh, finished me off pretty quickly that game. It was it was tough. I felt like with at least one of those Shantotos, I had a chance to stabilize and and go the full length of the game again. But overall, like I I, th- I was pretty happy with the first two games those are really good games so uh julian deserved the win for sure yeah especially that deck is getting famous at this point other people are playing it as we're seeing it on ff decks you brought up today yeah Um, that's so cool that's amazing yeah so at this point Uh, julian um went on to his next match he was supposed to play the waff deck uh but that player had to um leave for a hockey game so we instead had the win water player come up and uh go through that round and play uh julian and they went three games it was uh really exciting and after that julian was off to the finals against yuda and they played a three game set that went all the way to the third game six six damage just insane julian does all this stuff to come back, swings, does the damage, it's Gabranth. Here comes the Shantoto, 9 CP Shantoto to Yuda's hand, which allows him to go off on the Rampier combo, putting Julian super far behind. Yuda goes in for the kill, 7 CP Odin on EX Burst, all of a sudden uh, Julian's back in, they're both almost at deck out, it came down to the final turns and Yuda was able to win and win the whole, win a box and congratulations to him, we wanted to have him on the podcast but he wasn't available today, but we'll get him on in the coming weeks, but man that was a super cool final. Yeah, if you wanted um, a match worthy of a of a number one or of a winner box, like a championship match. That's that was the match for it. I think that was probably the probably the match of the entire tournament, and 
yeah, congrats to both guys. Like those are some damn good decks with some damn good players. Yeah, I wish that we we had uh, like filmed that final match or something, but we didn't. Well, so. you just said actually funny enough, you just said that he might uh, start breaking out the filming equipment and start nice. streaming again, which I think would be super sick. Yeah, well, I, I used to film matches, but I I definitely couldn't do it now because I put a lot of time into editing them and and that would just be too much for the Missidia post with all the other stuff that I do. So. Well, also with uh, your potty mouth while we're playing, I don't think that's uh, YouTube appropriate. Yeah, well, no, <laughs> that's true. Uh, <laughs> no, but the, and the other thing is too that like, there is a that is probably the number one type of content that's out there. Is just there's a lot of people that just do gameplay videos, and there's so many. Like, there's five different stores that do gameplay videos and streaming, and some channels that just do gameplay videos. Uh, along with the other stuff, so I feel like it's pretty saturated at this point, so I'm going to focus on other areas. No, for sure. I just think it'd be cool. Like, Why not? Yeah, well, I want to start getting the deck lists up when I have decks again. I I agree. Um, I can help you out with that. Because I really want to see that up there, too. I thought it was really cool every week that we would see our locals get kind of promoted on FF decks. So. Well, do you, know like why, do you know why I stopped doing it? Why'd you stop doing it? Because last year, everyone started um, saying, like, oh, we're going to go to the Crystal Cup. I don't want my deck list to be online. Oh, um, my God. And, and how many of them actually went to the Crystal Cup? Yeah, well, uh, you know what? The water one, a, a pretty large amount of us did. But it didn't really matter because everyone was playing Water Wind, Mono Ice, uh, Mono Lightning, Wind Water, so, like, mono, like all this stuff. And the lists had, like, everyone had their particular card they liked, you know? But... Honestly, it's nothing new. It's there was nothing there that like. First of all, no one's ever going to recognize you at a Crystal Cup and say like, "Oh, I remember at Magic Stronghold week like fifteen, you played this deck, and now I know what's in your deck." But oh, I know this guy. He has an FF nine deck. You know, like if if someone had something truly unique, like for example, the Ridia deck. Now, if Julian didn't want to play it, post his Ridia deck. I would never post that for sure. But if it's an established meta deck, if someone plays Fire Ice, that was another one, Fire Ice, FF6, it's like... That's, we know what's in that there's, deck. Come on, yeah. There's literally no argument that I would accept to not post that. So anyway, people kept not wanting to post their decks, so I didn't have any decks to post, and the whole thing kind of died down. Because we were, like, for a good year and a bit, we were posting our deck lists every single week, um, which is cool. Yeah, I hated that we fell off of that. Like, it was super cool, I think people need to chill out honestly guys we're all friends but y'all need to chill out with that just yeah. post your deck list no one's deck none of your no none of our decks are that absolutely unique that except, except for the Ridia. julian yeah. except for the Ridia, julian i'll understand that's pretty sick yeah um, no but, but the, the rest I, of us okay we're playing mono water mono ice like yeah wind water we all know what yrp is it's not this groundbreaking thing yeah, and it also it's some a uh, point that I really you know take exception to as someone that collects FF decks data for the Missidia post. Um, like pe people are posting less than they used to, and also during the competitive season, people posted way less than the than uh, the rest of the year. And I understand some of it. Again, I do, but like overall, I think that we need to to chill out a bit with uh, hiding your deck list because there's just it's not as big a deal as, as people might think it's re yeah it's really not we the meta is established and it's going to be until opus 11 there's nothing to hide yeah okay so we're going to move on to our improvement segment in just a second so let's get into it okay so I'll quickly go through my, my notes here. You know what Again. I think? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. It would be really cool if in between these segments we could have like commercial. Let's get some sponsorships. Subway, yeah. get at us. Yeah. Cobb's Bread, jump on in here. I wonder if like is Cobb's Bread a thing in the States? Because I think like most of our listeners are United from the United States. If, you, if uh, you're if you listening to this, like, and you're comment, in the States. comment on the video and say if Cobb's Bread exists down there. If but, not, uh, you have to. You you got to come up here and try some Cobb's bread. Yeah, that stuff is. It would be bananas. cool if we eventually got big enough for a sponsor, but until then, we're gonna just power through with uh, some Final Fantasy IV music in between the segments. 
Oh, great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so for in terms of improving myself and my deck, uh, I was really thrilled with my attitude, and I'm just, I want to keep on working on that and setting my expectations before the event and, and talking myself through it. Uh, at the end of the tournament, I had been knocked out but I was smiling and I was playing more games. I went right into it. Someone asked to play. Uh, Greg asked me to play some games. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And I even I thought like, oh, I'm gonna put my ice earth away. And I was like, no, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep playing it. I'm gonna get more games in. And I feel like again, remember the the few weeks ago when I had those um, the issue with the the timing of the my matches and I felt really salty. Like I, I left after that tournament was over this one. I stayed all the way to the end and just kept playing more games. And I was just really happy with that result. So that was good for the deck list. Even though the bricking never happened in testing, I just can't stand the thought of that happening in reunion. So I'm cutting my dark cards from six to four. So instead of running two Regans and two Gestals, I'm going to run one of each. Um, this is going to have Genesis make it back into the list, uh, as well as a Capricious Reaper. Um, so that's something I want to test. I want to see if the untargetable aspect of it really messes with Rampier as they don't play summons. Um, and that's it's a pseudo an... FF90 card. Exactly. And it also it works on the, uh, um, what's it called, uh, Waff deck as well. Like if they, if they haven't dumped their hands, like if they want to play stuff after combat, they can't because if they swing and ping my Capricious Reaper, and if they want to ping it off, they're going to have to ping twice, well, then they're going to discard two That's cards. two cards. Yeah. So I'm going to try that out. So Renoa is also going to be leaving the deck for now while I test more cards. Uh, she only really hits a couple of things. To be honest, Sephiroth is the only thing that I've really used her on. And the, there's, like, those niche games where you use it on a Kuja or you use it on... Um, like a Reagan, but honestly, I just didn't cast her very much. So she's getting out of there, and a 5 CP Delita is coming in, but I might also put an Opus 10 Squall in. The Delita's pretty interesting. Like, it really, in some of my matches so far, it's really shut down some situations, and then in other matchups, it's Earth CP. So I'm really on the fence about it, but it's super fun, and it's a Homer card, so we're keeping it for now. <laughs> of course. My whole deck is a Homer deck. It is full of Homer cards, so I mean... You gotta have I can't fun. Judge that. Exactly. Gotta... Oh, sorry, bud. <laughs> Darn it up. My favorite uh, thing is um, how you critique yourself sometimes. You're just like, oh, you know, I put this card in and it's super interesting. Like, you're talking about it from a third person perspective almost. It's really funny. Well, <laughs> I appreciate that. So, there's, there's one other thing that I did. Are you excited to hear what it is? Oh, I can't wait. I put a Duke Largan, just one, you know? Just to bump your ice a little bit. I just want to beef up those ice boys a little bit. Well, think about it. Capricious Reaper, right? So he, it's an eight k. It's a nine k all of a sudden, and that's gonna take. That's gonna take some more discarding and more cards to deal with. So yeah, it's actually pretty relevant. The majority of the forwards I play are, are um, and uh, yeah. the Earth forwards I play are Cabranth, and I don't care about his power. And then Cecil, who's a nine k already, so he's fine. Well, um, Gabranth powers himself out of up eventually, anyway. Exactly. So, so yeah. like the the seven and six, seven and eight k ice cards going to nine k, eight k, whatever, and then the nine k is going to ten k. Super relevant. Uh, Super relevant. So that's good. Uh, the other good news about the deck is that it just feels really good overall to play. I'm really gelling with the list. I don't miss the cam at all now. It's fine. You can get out of here, cam. Too much uh, too much time invested in playing him and stuff. So. So overall, I like the deck, and I just need to make sure I don't brick. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, I think I think dropping those dark cards was probably the right decision. Um, yeah, with Cam, you didn't really need a lot of color fi fixing to go with the uh, Chaos, which I get it. Like, you want the Chaos down to be able to play the Hinds and the Reagans and the Emperor Gestals as much as you can, but, eh, you know, your deck can run pretty smoothly without that whole package, so... Or without having to at least have multiple dark cards on. I think that'll definitely save you from bricking. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. Okay, awesome. Great well choices. let's let's talk thanks. Thank you, sir. You know, I I appreciate that. Let's talk about your FF9 deck. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna take a bit of a break from that. As I said before, I was planning on taking a bit of a hiatus and just come back with a refreshed mindset. 
How long and did your I, hiatus last for? Hour and a half, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two weeks to an hour and a half. That was quick. Um, yeah, pretty much as soon as I got home, I just kind of started reevaluating everything. Yeah, so I'm moving away from it from from the FF9 base build now uh, for now. So that means that things like Artemisian, Ico, Black Waltz, and Mog aren't going to be my mainstay backups. And trying to build around one CPVV just being OP. I'm moving more towards uh, more of a a water fire, more tempo deck with. Uh, which, with a lot of inspiration from one of the uh, from a Magic the Gathering ch- uh, Challenger deck, actually. Interesting. And I'm, yeah, so I'm trying to build something similar to that. Um, it's based a lot off of the Opus 10 Zac. So my combo with that is every time a fire forward enters the field, uh, deal something 2k, or when a seven forward enters, deal another 2k. So my my main combo with that is to pair him with things like Gilgamesh and Vivi, two CP Vivi, and which was met with some criticism from Alex, but I think he learned today that it's not a terrible combo. So basically, what my plan is is to swing with uh, swing with Gilgamesh, bring back two CP Vivi, deal something two K with Zach, and then blow up Vivi for another five K. So that's just seven K right there, which is enough to deal with. A handful of things, right? Maybe every now and again, I have to pop another, pop another two, but to make it a uh, 10k damage, so that's pretty sick. Um, and then being able to pop Vivi instead of playing the one CP Vivi is that he just keeps getting recycled, right? So it's just he's out 2k to the break zone, another 5k, and then the next turn I can do the same thing, and I'm still playing four CP Phoenix, so I can even buff that up by another 2k. So let's say it's 2k from Phoenix, 2k from Zach, 5k from BV. Um I'm not great at math, but I think that's an IK. <laughs> you know what, you know what's cool about that VV and this is what I loved so much about it back in Opus 3 when I played the card is that it's totally safe to leave out and block with it and then do the thing you're going to do. So it blocks the damage pop- and then pop it. Um Whereas the other VV, the one CP one, if they clear it with like a Valfor or something like that, then you just don't have the blocker. Yes, it's easy to recur and there's a um, downside to them breaking the one CP VV, but it's the exact same situation as this VV, except this VV, you can respond to them using removal on it. Hence, they will never use removal on it. Uh, And then you can wait till their combat phase. They're going to attack with their forward. You block with the VV, then use its ability, uh, the damage isn't going through, and then maybe you're killing off the second attacker and you're taking zero damage that turn. Um, there's like really good interactions with it, and the fact that it puts itself in the break zone sets up so nicely with things like uh, Phoenix and Gilgamesh. Like, yeah, exactly. And then this is actually a little tech play that uh, you shipped at me last night was to put in the 2CP uh, Shadow backup. So Vivi's just going to repeatedly put himself in the break zone. So then that'll, that whole interaction is going to kill something. And then I did this today, too, against UR match earlier. Vivi goes to the break zone. One in tap shadow, crack it, deal something another 9k. All of a sudden, you have a half de- you know, half decent board clear where you're shipping off two of their forwards to the break zone. And I honestly think you should maybe even have a second shadow in there. Honestly, I think you might be right, because that, uh, that was a pretty big swing of that in my favor for that when I did that turn. I really do like the 2CP um, Opus 4 stage, though, because because it's um, Zach dealing... I have dealing... that in there, too. Exactly. I'm, oh, I'm looking at your list right now, by the way. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, so whenever Zach... Zach's the one dealing the damage, so if you use it on him for the rest of the turn, all of his 2Ks that he says on his text are 4Ks. So if it sets up, like... And, and that's that's perfect for Sage because you don't want to break a backup lightly, but if you set up a big turn where you're going to use Zach quite a bit, then it becomes very relevant. For example, if you're able to play 5CP Cloud and 5CP Cloud's ability is going to kill something, then Zach's going to do 4K to something else, but if you pop Sage, it's going to do 8K to something else. So on one turn, you could play a forward and clear two other forwards, and then you're in great position. Yeah, exactly it's 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 nutty because cloud comes in um and you're pretty much i think i had a turn earlier where cloud came in zach did his thing with cloud vivi came in 
uh, Vivi did his thing with Zach, and then if you can add in a Sage or a Shadow there, it just that's a that's a huge tempo swing. That's a huge board clear. Now, if have fun coming back. If you use Cloud's second ability when Cloud is put into the from the field to the break zone, you can remove the top ten cards from your deck uh, from the game, and then then return them to the field doll. That retriggers the Zach, right? It sure does. Yeah. So that's, that's another, pretty neat. That's pretty nifty. Man, you run twelve summons too. I like my summons. There's I'm like, a huge. I love summons. I love summons a lot. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I really like that uh, that Le, that uh, Leviathan. Well, that came from uh, Yuda. Yuda gave me that idea. Like, you got a lot of EX bursts, and you're not running a heck of a. And he was worried about my backup consistency. So I think running two of those with Yuna, so it's not overpaying for a three CP summon. Or if I hit it on the EX, that's just drawing. That's just drawing me a card and then fixing my hand for the next turn. Yeah, exactly. I think that's uh, a pretty good, pretty good inclusion. Then I don't know if you need the poo poo because you do have the the fairy and the Bismarck as well for the Garnet. Poo poo. <laughs> yeah, <it> sounds so <laughs> weird. If, like, if there's someone new to FFTCG that's never heard of poo poo. They're like, what the hell did he just say? Yeah, I'm just gonna play poo poo. Poo poo is a really good card. Yeah. Don't don't poo poo the poo poo. This list is real uh, poo poo. Oh, no! It's, I'm wondering, like, oh, I guess you just don't have that much fire. So it's, I, when I before I had looked at the list, I was thinking like, well, maybe you need a LeBro because that's gonna put just like it puts Rain out of the reach of some removal, it puts Zach out of the reach of some removal. But then you don't really have enough fire to take full advantage of uh, a booster like that. You're my LeBro. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's accurate. I yeah. know, I thought about it, but I think what my solution might be because one of my Zacks went to the break zone against you. Yeah. And when you or not the break zone, the damage zone, excuse me. And then when you got rid of that one Zach, I was like, ah, oh, jeez, I really could use another one. I'm running two right now. Now, but maybe I'll play with that number. I'm running three Ash, and I don't think that's the, so. I think I'll bump uh, four CP Ash down to two, and I'll bump Zach up to uh, three. Mm, yeah, I think that's. I think that might fix that. I think just because Zach is so important to the deck, you have to do with that. Yeah. That, um, yeah. but um, I mean, I'd be interested in seeing more Furion and even something like a two CP Scholar in Water. You like because this is a turn where it's really viable for you to play a Furion, bounce it with the Scholar, play it again, and maybe you're doing like eight K to two things fairly right. fairly easily, or even just like protection. Like they use their big removal on your Zach, and you Scholar it back to your hand. Wasting their You're CP like, oh, and playing it, playing it back the next turn, and when he enters yeah, like, the field, what? he does 4K when he enters the field. So it's, you know, nothing to shake a stick at, right? Yeah, like it's it's pretty neat. Um, I think that could be. Oh man, there's there's you know we need to not do all of this on the podcast though. <laughs> this could take. This will fill up an entire show on the podcast. Is talking about rebuilding this deck. Let's look at one list. That could be a cool episode if we don't have something to do. We just look at one list and we talk about it for the whole episode. <laughs> tempting oh okay. it, this is also one of those lists before we end the show that you look at my old list and it was probably on ff decks it's like an 80 dollar deck on its pricing and then you look at this list and it's 112 dollars. so you feel a little bit better about it for some reason it's yeah. just a little satisfying for that number to go up before we do wrap it up one one little thing i'd like to to bring up is a thought that i had that this four cp gabranth legend has everyone knew it was good although there was a lot of people that actually rated it pretty lowly low but i think everyone understood that it was great um as a searcher but man does it enable the current decks right now like for my ice earth it's obviously good uh for waf it's one of the biggest parts about like that no matter what you're gonna get a rain so many different ways and in rampier it's absolutely vital to set up your cane and, and shantotos and without it, it's a lot harder to assemble the hand combo that you need in, in Rampier. So that card is, is pretty scary. I mean, it's a, it's a must-of for must-of. It's a must-have. Are that the acronyms, right? Whatever. Abbreviation. It's, it's a must-have for Rampier and WAF because you need that free reign and you need that uh, you need to have a 9CP Chanteaude in your hand or a 9CP Prish. Otherwise, your combo is dead. Like, you have nothing. Yeah, just and it's obviously absolutely massive in Julian's uh, Rydia list. Um, I only run one of them, 
excited to have a lot of other ways to search, but it's yeah, no, I just want to kind of check in where 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 we're at with that card that it is for sure just a super great legend and that was very wise to pick up a playset when they were cheap. Yeah, we're on the same page. Good card. If Yeehaw. I played Earth, I'd probably <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's my line. Okay, so are I'm we the... gonna Oh sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, let's call it here. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Uh, that is it for this week's episode of the Mycidian Legend. Don't forget to use the promo code PORUMPALUM10 at cardsofevilise.com to get a discount on your order. And you can read my articles at themycidiapost.com. Check me out on YouTube and throw me a like on Facebook and a subscription on YouTube to show your support. Finally, we're going to thank FF Decks because this whole podcast, we were staring at an FF Decks screen looking at deck lists. So thank you for all your hard work, FF Decks. F yeah, man. F yeah, man. Um, also want to thank the good old uh, Magic Stronghold and Yuda for running a great winner box. He keeps everyone engaged, even if you don't win a game like myself. I walked away with plenty of promos and packs. So he's he's definitely keeping the community doing all he can to keep the community engaged and feel like they're getting something out of playing the game. So he's a, he's a great promoter for the game and thanks buddy. You're the best. That's actually despicable of us to not have mentioned, uh, that part of the, the, um, win a box. The prize support was incredible. There was a full second box, uh, that was donated to the event by Yuda, uh, to add prize support for all eight players. So we all got packs and promos, um, and it was absolutely incredible. He did such a good job running the event, and it was one of the best tournaments I've played in. So thank you absolutely. so much, Yuda, for that. Thank you so much, Magic Stronghold. Uh, and thank you so much, Mesidians, for listening. Uh, we'll see you next time. Say goodbye, David. See you all. I don't know when this will end up getting posted, but Merry Christmas. Hope you all are having a good holidays. Merry Christmas. Until next time. <laughs>